<laughs> so anyway, I'm a DM, you know, a dungeon master, nothing kinky or anything. I just got done winging an entire session of D&D, and boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, sometimes you gotta improv it, right? I mean, I play D&D feather or not, I have anything prepared. Okay? So, you know, I mean, listen, it's not like I'm a professional DM. I don't send them a bill. <laughs> anyway, hey, hey. Yes, and you suck. Oh, it looks like we found the foil. <laughs> well, that wasn't really sweet. It was splendid, in fact. Get off the stage. It's, uh, it's improv DMing on, on WebDM. You suck! Today's show is brought to you by Audible, a great place to get inspiration for your characters and campaigns. Visit audible.com slash webdm or text webdm to 500-500. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial and your first audiobook, plus two Audible originals are free. My recommendation for this week is Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's near-prophetic view of the future of computers and virtual reality with an eye looking back on the history of language, all set in a cyberpunk dystopia. This is my favorite book. It was Jim who first told me about it. Yeah, it's a total classic. So why don't you head on over to Audible because it's going to be an HBO show soon and you can figure out what all the fuss is about before you become chiseled spam. Once again, go to audible.com slash webdm or text WebDM to 500-500. So let's talk about improving and winging it and whatnot. So what do you do when yes and doesn't just cut it? Were you not prepared for this? I Did wasn't, you not prepare for this show? I was not prepared at all for this. You, this is an fuck, ironic meta fuck. confluence of yeah. show and, yeah. Yeah. All right, and reality. So what, do do? what do you do when you, okay, yeah. All you right. Just come on, just right. whatever, okay. first thing off the top of your head. No wrong answers. No wrong answers. Uh, panic. No. Um, no, no, panic. No, walk that's, away. that's only no. at the disco. Oh, shit. Um, uh, uh, blame it on your players. No. Uh, blame rail, it on the rail, Railroad them. Railroad them is, that's the answer. Railroad them. Make them do what you want them to do. All right. That's it for this show of Thanks WebDM. Thanks for watching WebDM. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the right, this is the right way to say this, but how do you prepare for improv uh, You have to, for one. Like, you, you, you do have to prepare for it. And improv in in the sense of you are going to have to uh, facilitate portions of the game you are not ready to or did not anticipate uh, or something, yeah. that, you know. Because the players were players, and you were like, oh, yeah, we're going to go do this thing, and you prepared everything to the right, and they go left after they said they were going to go right At, last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, happens all the time. That happens all the time, and in the time-honored tradition of, of game masters and referees everywhere, you were like, all right, and, uh, you know, let them do it, and then see, uh, see what happens. So, first of all, I think it's going to happen, and trying to prepare everything for every eventuality is not good probably not gonna work. Like, mm -hmm. I know there are some uh, DMs out there that like to have a very detailed and, and fully fleshed in world and they play in the same one all the time. And so in a sense, they do know what's out there. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't describe the, you know, the vast majority of DMs. And so you have to find, um, first of all, you have to find some way to relax <laughs> and just like understand it's gonna happen. I, you know, I know that this element of dungeon mastering has a lot of mystique surrounding it, a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, just the, I don't know, you see people talk about like improv and DMing all the time, and you would think that it's the only thing that you need uh, to dungeon master. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yes and, that's it, just do all the, do all the mm -hmm. tricks. Right, and uh, that might get you through a session, uh, it, you know, it, it, it might. Um, I don't, how satisfying it's going to be uh, largely depends on, you know, you and your play group and, uh, what you all want out of the game. Some people are fine with, um, you know, just having a session or, or even more, you know, completely made up on the spot and it's more freewheeling and uh, can often feel very exciting uh, for a session or two as everybody's just throwing out ideas. Yeah, let's do that, this, and the dice are uh, going your way. Um, but for like long-term play, it doesn't lend, it's not a style of DMing that lends itself well to that, mostly because I find uh, your ability to just make it up is going to hit a wall. And your ability to make it up in the face of the four to five other uh, potent human brains and <laughs> peoples uh, that you have around you will eventually get the better of you in terms of just, um, you know, trivializing the things you put in front of them or, uh, or just not being as 
satisfied with the experience because there's part of this about being a dungeon master that does require work. I mean, it's, it, it is. It's it, a purposeful effort. Yeah. And it's not always, uh, you know, fun in and of itself. Yeah, if you try to improv, it's kind of like a playing a game of narrative dodgeball with your players where they're all throwing <laughs> and you're just like, you know, you, gotta, you, you want to plan. You want to build some defenses. You, you want to yeah, you build some of it. And it's like, it's okay. This is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I find this, so often it's when DMs resist the needing to make things up. They resist the, the, the off the cuff, oh, I didn't expect this. That you do get a lot of uh, you get a lot of problems because there are, for a great many players the ability to just go left when they want to or to go right or do this other thing yeah. is the appeal of role playing that, that, that's yeah. what differentiates it from nearly every other game. <laughs> so know? so if the DM doesn't just throw an overwhelming encounter forcing the players to turn back right, sure. Yeah. Like <laughs> how how do you how do you continue going left? It's a confidence game. Uh, it, it really is, and it, it is a you, you gain that confidence by doing it, and understand that it doesn't need to be perfect. Your ability to make things up on the fly, which is a large component of role playing, that your ability to do that will improve over time and will vary from session to session. You know, if you're DMing and it's at the end of a long week and you haven't had time to prep and you're just not feeling it, you don't have a lot of energy, then your ability to DM, period in that situation is you know, at a diminished capacity as opposed to, man, I'm fresh, ready to go. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a Saturday, we don't have anything else to worry about. Um, that's a, a different situation. So just recognizing that. Like many things uh, with this, but especially with improv, because you are making things up on the spot, you're just sort of pulling things out of your imagination or like building off of something that a player said or something. Because so much of it is a, a mental exercise, making sure that you are mentally ready for it Mm -hmm. And mentally ready to DM is probably the best thing you can do. Get some sleep, have eat, you know, eat good food. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, listen to your players, know them, know yourself. That's the the foundation of confidence um, that uh, that you'll build upon. That's all self help kind of stuff, and you know, listen to us or not if you want. But mm -hmm. uh, there have are, a book coming out. Uh, shit. The DM inside you. The DM. <laughs> Oh wait, that's a, the different book. That's Never a different. That's a different book. Uh, that's our fanfic. No. <laughs> right, right, right. I understand the apprehension of. of yeah, yeah. I I feel a little bit of it too whenever it happens to be uh, with my players. But um, understand this: like everyone wants the game to succeed. It, it's not like well, very rarely that you'll have a player who deliberately wants to derail things in the since that nobody gets to play. Uh, for the most part, if you've got players and they keep showing up week after week and it seems like they're having a good time, then they're gonna forgive you for a lot of things because they want this experience to continue as well. And so they're not gonna like pick everything over with a fine tooth comb. They're not gonna be as critical as you are of yourself, probably. Well, I mean, that, that's never the case. <laughs> right. So we, we are our own worst critics and yeah, it's, uh, yes, very, very many times. Yeah. <laughs> Understand number one, it does not need to be a perfect answer. Uh, what you come up with on the spot uh, does not need to, to be absolutely perfect. It should be consistent. And, and uh, that is something, uh, you know, that you, things you can do to help with that, uh, which we'll sort of end the show with. But it, consistency is way more important than perfection or, or anything. Uh, because consistency helps the players uh, maintain their belief in the world and mm -hmm. its uh, sort of logic. Now, which is the biggest, I think, pitfall of improv gaming or using improv techniques is that you would just punch holes and run roughshod all over the internal logic of your game. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, and like you said, it, this falls under the umbrella of preparing. Like, you don't have to know everything, but you know at least the broad strokes of your world. You know how this society functions, right? You know how, or, you know, you know how this dungeon functions sure. and who runs it. Right, right, right. You don't need to maybe necessarily have the next level prepared, but yeah. you have an idea of who's down there at least. Sure, sure, yeah. And, and thinking in terms of, like, a dungeon is, uh, like, you know, is a good starting point for traditional games because of just how the structure of it mirrors so much about what play is and, and yeah you don't need to know necessarily it's a good idea to if you have time prep for it um, but if you find yourself with limited prep time and you want to offer the most freedom for your players the the most you know the most of this campaign sitting that's open to them and, and you know really don't want to him in their player agency as much as you uh, or any more than you have to taking time to come up with the tools you're gonna need in the middle of the game. 
uh, it, you know, the things that you have trouble coming up with on the fly, the things that your players ask to do uh, that, you know, if you were prepping the session, it would take you a lot of time to prepare. You want to kind of like create some par-baked tools, right? If you're not familiar, par-baked is like uh, you buy a loaf of bread that's partially baked and mm -hmm. <laughs> you finish the rest of it at home. You get the nice fresh baked bread, but you don't have to necessarily do all of the mixing uh, and uh, proofing and, and all that and stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The most common example of this that you probably already do or heard of is just creating a list of names. Names that are... Yeah. It helps a lot. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> uh, and if it's... and Names of whoever, names of NPCs, names of taverns, names of shops, names of... Uh, you know, professors that are going to be at the conference, uh, names of the cultists who are going to be traveling in the caravan with you, uh, <laughs> names of, uh, you know, wizards at the academy, fighters in the mercenary company, whatever it is. If you're, if you're running like a really long-term campaign and this is a generalized uh, names list, then somewhere between 20 and 50 names is probably going to be uh, a good bet. Um, but if it's like a one-shot uh, or, or something like that, then you know, I don't know, six, seven, a dozen, however many uh, that you feel you need. Because names have a feel to them. They've got a fit. Uh, you know, you, you never know what exactly is going to be appropriate for that moment at the table. You don't know if the name you come up with is, sounds exactly like another NPC's name or like yeah. starts with the same uh, similar sounding syllable or, or something. And then you've got a situation where it's like, wait, we've, there's the two NPCs and they had like an an in the first part. And, you know, this is where uh, simplicity can often uh, really pay dividends because you don't necessarily get to, uh, you know, you don't trip over your own cleverness, as it were. Yeah, my, my problem is uh, I, I start doing alliteration. I start giving yeah. off, you know, S names or right. whatever if yeah. I don't have something pre-prepared. Yeah, yeah, you'll fall uh, into those kind of habits. Yeah. yeah. You know, are you running an urban campaign and your players like to just pop into little shops and taverns and things like that? Then, you know, what do they have in them? Who's there? Uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of my personally favorite just sort of products that I buy are nested tables, which are just these giant grid things that have like name of the tavern, who all's there, what's the proprietor like, mm -hmm. what sort of games do they play there, what kind of drink are they known for. And you can either read them straight across or roll on each column. And you know, this is where I, I find Excel uh, or, uh, or uh, Google Sheets are my, uh, my friends because just put a list in there and it's already kind of numbered and uh, mm -hmm. much more easier to organize. So uh, whether that's names of NPCs, uh, descriptive uh, words that will help you create evocative descriptions in combat or of a location or something like that, you don't want to go looking up in the uh, thesaurus ahead of time. So just like grab one when you're prepping and pull 50 or 60 words out of it that you might use or just maybe you don't even use the word you just like read it and your brain goes not that one this one yeah and yeah. you know just something um can help uh set dressing when i'm running a dungeon crawl most of what's behind my screen are big lists of trash that's in the dungeon random things you find on this goblin uh <laughs> you know of wall decorations or or whatever just because I don't want a crowded map, I don't want a crowded dungeon key. I want something that's like map on one page, key on the other, but I still want it to be an interesting place. Right, I still right. don't want them to walk into a bunch of empty square rooms. They go like, oh, it's a square room, but there's like torn tapestries on the wall and what looks to be remnants of an old battle shoved into a corner or something like that, or old rat's nest or something. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things that I like to come up with myself, just lists. Thing, take the work off of my brain. You can do this and you yeah. can prepare for it, but what are some of the pitfalls? Oh. <laughs> I mean, we talked yeah. about like alliteration, like if you're not prepared with a list, how you can kind of fall into ruts like right, that. Right, right, right. There are a lot of pitfalls. I think probably the most common complaint uh, that I see about uh, the improv style of GMing, sort of the make it up as you go, comes from players. Mm -hmm. And it's from players who, who feel like that these sessions in which their, uh, their DMs are making things up are less satisfying. And, and sometimes that's because there's you know, less attention paid to maintaining the internal logic or cohesion. Uh, some of it is because they, they lack depth and detail. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of um, make it up on the spot or I'm just gonna do this uh, you know, on the fly is it, it paints in broad strokes because you have to by necessity. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. if you haven't prepared to add detail 
uh, at the moment at point of delivery, uh, to, I guess, to use a modern uh, marketing term or whatever, is, uh, <laughs> is that they're, you're just gonna have kind of a bland game. What you find is that when DMs who start making it up on the spot is that there comes sort of an aversion to too much risk on their part. They don't want to like throw something too big out there because they're yeah. just sort of like, you know, if you guys can't handle this thing, I, you know, I don't want this to lead to a TPK because I just on a whim threw it out there. Then it might lead to say, uh, you know, combats that have no stakes and are just sort of there to take up time. Yeah, because we haven't had a combat in a couple of Because we haven't had a combat in a couple of sessions, and I once read that one quote from that one detective writer about whenever there's a lull in the story, have someone with a gun come in. You know, it's just <laughs> like, well... Just start shooting. I don't know, it kind of works for like pulp detective stories, I guess, <laughs> but maybe not for every D&D &D game. That's one, where it, it, it's just kind of the events of play lack stakes, they lack consequence, they lack uh, connection to what's happening. Is just like, yeah, we wandered around the map and rolled some dice on a table and that was it, you know? Like, we played D&D, &D, we played an RPG, but not very satisfying. And yeah. for players who are looking for an in-depth experience, an immersive experience, they really want to get into it, this, they will swear off any DM who claims to use improv techniques if they have too many of these sessions. And they'll just be like, nope, I, I would rather be railroaded and uh, have my choices negated so that at least I can adventure in a world that is alive. Yeah. <laughs> the irony of getting tied up and railroaded so you can feel alive. Right. <laughs> to me, there is a difference between uh, improv and making it up on the spot. Improv, and I, you know, I, I am not drawing at all from improv actors because I am not an improv actor. I don't know anything about it, and I'm, that's not where my experience lies. But mm -hmm. I would bet that they do a lot of practicing. I don't know, maybe oh, it's just me. No, there's a lot of games. There's a lot of games, a lot of word association games, a lot of rules that you have to follow. Sure, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, you, the, the, the cliched yes and. Yeah, But yeah, also yeah. just like, you know, anything someone puts in, you don't, you never... Discount. Sure, yeah, yeah, it's, right. It becomes it's part, part of, of the, the narrative yeah, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the problem is you start doing this and your players start just throwing shit out because they realize you are. Yeah, yeah. And your world can get, get kind of bonkers if you... It can, especially if you're if, if that's the only advice that you're following. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, I am supposed to just say yes, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes and. Well, that is a big piece of advice presented very simply yeah. uh, and, and is often not uh, unpacked and further explained. You know, sometimes no is appropriate. Sometimes yes, but. You know, there are times when, you know, you do want to say, like, yeah, player, that, that if we follow through with that, that is going to be too disruptive or it doesn't seem like everybody's on board with this idea. So this is where knowing your players and knowing yourself really comes in handy. And it really is, you know, it lets you make that judgment. Is what the player is suggesting a, uh, a good idea? Is it gonna enhance the game? Or is it just zany mm -hmm. and weird? And we're all just sort of impressed by how weird it is. And then if we sat and thought about it for a few minutes, we'd be like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. And Yeah, Jim, why don't you let me play my Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Hexblade? <laughs> well, because, we, actually, I'd probably it'd be like a sorry old. Anyway, yeah, no, that's pretty right. cool. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, that's all I got off the top of my head. Right. Uh, and so, like, I, to me, improv as a DM is less about yes and is part of it saying yes being willing to open up your game to player input player change is a part of that but that doesn't mean I don't have a say it, yeah, yeah. it doesn't mean that we're gonna violate the tone and theme and genre of the game unless that's the point point. and it's also very different than just like oh I don't have anything prepared for you guys we're just gonna make it up on the spot like that is to me is the one cardinal sin of DMing because but you don't want your DM saying that to you I really don't <laughs> because to me number one even if that's the truth. And that happens, right? Life gets in the way. You don't want to miss a session. You want to hang out with your friends. You, you like DMing. You can pull something out of your ass. Just don't say anything. Yeah. Just like the, 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 it's a confidence game, right? And if you give away, the, if, you, if you show everybody the magic trick, if you show everybody what's behind the curtain, then it lessens the experience. And I know that there's a lot of bravado and bluster around DMing. Uh, you know, I'm a killer DM. My, my players live in fear of me. Like, then how, why do they keep coming back week to week? Or <laughs> I'm a, you know, I'm a, nobody could tell me I don't, you know, I don't plan anything. And I'm a totally off the cuff, make it up as I go along DM. And I've done that for years. It's just like, well, the real litmus test is, do people show up and does it look like they're having fun? If the answer to those questions is yes, then you probably can just turn off the video. You don't need to watch the rest because yeah. you're doing something right. 
but there are a great many people where that's an unsatisfying experience and having something in place that gives you a structure to rely on when you don't know what's going to happen is so, so, so much better and less stressful for you mm -hmm. when the players do something unexpected. Yeah. You know, which like we already talked about, it's why random tables are a really good tool. Oh, I mean, exactly. Right. And, and, you know, they're one of the pitfalls of a random table in this situation is like that it leads to events that are disconnected from the rest of the game. Right. That you would look at, uh, you know, the events of a random encounter and just go, why did this thing attack us? You know, especially if you think of encounters solely in terms of combat. And that's a, a to me, that's a misuse of a tool. Mm -hmm. that the random encounter role uh, is very specific to the dungeon, or sometimes urban play. Uh, it can be used to simulate uh, the movement of a setting around the PCs. You know, the goblins patrol these halls. What are we going to do? I don't know, but once every 10 minutes, the DM is going to check it out. Um, or it could be, you know, like a street encounter or something like that. If you're a DM and you're concerned that the random encounters may, that you uh, come up with on the fly are not going to be satisfying, then before the game, roll up like six or so. Yeah. You know, a short number, uh, four to six, so that it's easy to pick up a, uh, a smaller die and uh, make a roll if you need to. And spend a few minutes thinking about those four to six encounters and what you can do to tie them into the player's interests, to maybe each other, to the events that are going on in the game. And just a couple of notes. It doesn't take a lot. Just whatever you need to jog your memory while everybody's sitting down and getting their dice out and chatting and talking and everything. You make it part of your pregame prep to just have a little list there. And that way you don't have to deal with a bigger wandering monster list or whatever, or you have at least some options available, ready to go, that you've given some thought to and it will make it easier to sort of tie those in um, to the campaign. The other tool is to ask a question through the encounter. And this is maybe a high-minded, I'm, I'm not talking about like literal NPCs asking the PCs a question, but like, why are you doing why this? Why is this happening? Yeah, <laughs> but like <laughs> using the encounter to pose a question or introduce a new piece of information that's incomplete yeah. that will then spur player speculation. Yeah. Because one of the techniques of improv that you can do is introduce elements that you don't really know yet what's going on. And while you could get into like J.J. Abrams' The Lost Territory over here, uh, I'm not going to talk about whatever else he's done since then, uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and have something that's incoherent, it, again, the, something that you do occasionally, something that you do uh, you know, w when you need to, and then you go back after the fact and fill in the details, make sure it's consistent. And retcon if you need to, because yeah. you can do that. Well, <laughs> getting back to J.J. Abrams, uh, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> doing a, we'll do an episode on improv directly. Later. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the other two things, real quick, about pitfalls are, are spotlight time and pacing. Oh, you de know, definitely. Because uh, if you're caught up in your own world by trying to make something move forward. Yeah. Yeah, it, then you could easily get stuck in a rut, especially you know, if you haven't prepared anything, you don't have an idea of, say, I've got four hours of game time to fill. I, I know we, I would, it would be great for us to get to X, Y, and Z, but you know, we'll get to where we get to uh, or to accomplish whatever goal that the players are setting out for. Um, but if you, for instance, know that it takes forever to finish a combat because you're playing a very detailed tactical game, then like, make sure at the very least you factor that in, <laughs> you know, if you're yeah. wanting to, you know, end on a big fight or to, uh, you know, have a big battle as a way to fill time, just be cognizant of that. Because a lot of times what happens in these sessions is there's a lot of stalling, there's a lot of delaying, there's a lot of dialogue, uh, but, you know, because it's like, oh, well, players wanted to go to this place and, you know, they got caught up talking to this interesting NPC that you came up with on the fly and they've taken it, you know, longer than you expected. And, and you're trying to like bring them back towards this other thing, if you, you know, and it just, there's a lot of push and pull, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of what, you know, without a structure to the adventure, without clear goals, mm -hmm. a lot of competing interest. One player wants to do one thing, another wants to do another. You're prepared to do a third thing. And so just balancing all of those competing interests takes practice, it takes patience. It takes players who are willing to sit around doing nothing, but still be invested because they care about the events that other players are going through, the events of the game as a whole. And mm -hmm. you have to foster that. It doesn't come out of nowhere. 
you know, it, yeah. it, it takes work, effort. Yeah, and another list you can do is, and I do this sometimes, where I'll put my players' names down. Yeah. And anytime they have a moment, yeah. I put a check next to their name. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. I know, like, okay, they've had their moment, and then I can look at who's left, and, like, yeah. how can I present yeah. uh, uh, either of a challenge or a, a piece of information yeah. that they're interested in or that they can use their skill set to overcome. Right, That right, way right. everybody can get a moment. Yeah, like, yeah. And, and knowing that, keeping track of your players in, in that respect of, of how often you put the spotlight on them or they bring it to themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, like, what kind of spotlight time do they like? For me, I know when I'm a player, I like spotlight time that, uh, that, that uh, furthers things like intrigue, uh, the exchange or acquisition of information or action. You yeah. know, I know that when I when the spotlight is on me as a player, I don't want to just twiddle my thumbs. I don't want to just talk to somebody. I am fine just rolling dice for the inconsequential meet an NPC or, or you know when I'm a player that is. Yeah. We can hand wave shopping. I don't I don't mind. Um, yeah. I, well, for <laughs> unless, me, it's, unless I got something I really want to buy. Yeah. <laughs> now for me, I think you know, Jim. I, I just any situation that will let me have a good one liner at the end. Yeah, and I'm good. or at the beginning of yeah. to signal combat. Right. Yeah. I'm golden. Yeah. As long as I can get my action one-liners in. Yeah. It does not matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what I mean. Like most players have very like low expectations, not in like the the bad sense, but just mm -hmm. what they want out of a game sometimes is very simple, and yeah. and, and and it's much more about emotional satisfaction and a sort of visceral experience than any kind of high concept thing. And mm -hmm. as DMs, we're often very high concept, you know, we think things through and, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> not every, down into the... <laughs> yeah, not every, every player needs every session to be at once a therapy session for themselves right. while running through a cathartic experience of what's going on in their current lives right. while, while scratching every narrative and action itch. Like, no, yeah. no, you can just pick like one of those You can pick things. like one of that. You're just like, you this know. other guy over here is just trying to kill some kobolds. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, right. yeah. I'm trying to get over my fear of swimming. Right. Well, I have to yeah. go to the pool this weekend yeah. for that birthday party. You know. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you listen. People often aren't aware of what they bring to the game table, yeah. and they are. And a lot of players, they don't really think about why they like the game or what it is mm -hmm. they get out of it. But they know. They yeah. they might not be able to articulate it, but they can tell you when it's not. Being able to read the room, yeah. being able to uh, being able to talk to players after the fact as well, mm -hmm. and being honest with your own uh, sort of mistakes while still keeping the mystique alive yeah. uh, is is another skill that you'll get better at. And yeah. uh, the beautiful thing about DMing is none of these things are, no one thing is essential. Yeah. You you know, there's if you're not good at one element of, of running a game or coming up with something on the fly, then focus on what you're really good at. As a DM <laughs> who, you know, you're running games uh, for your players, you will, you will be able to have more satisfying sessions if you focus on your strengths less than shoring up your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you shouldn't improve or, or learn more about yourself, but if you are a intrigue heavy, I love to just role play NPCs off the cuff kind of DM, then games which feature that more than say minimal uh, dialogue and maximal action are probably where you're gonna find more mm -hmm. satisfying sessions. Well, and also remember, uh, even though maybe it's your players that got you into this session issue of, yeah, yeah, but like yeah. getting you into it, throwing the session thing, off track, is but it? But yeah. remember that they are still at the table and they are still involved and they can still share the cognitive load. Yes. So you you can just you know start it off with like, hey, here's this situation that mm -hmm. maybe you rolled on an, an encounter, and yeah. let them latch onto it yes. and let them help build. The, the tension and that's why also you know in addition to just having like a wandering monster table or something like that having a small list of just short encounters uh, plot hooks is what people would call them uh, whenever I was learning as DM just like little things they're incomplete they're scenario setups they're they they do not really have um, you know they have nothing about their resolution yeah, yeah. five cobalts looking for something five cobalts looking for something it, it, it usually yeah. is a, a situation which will immediately involve the the PCs uh, some sort of antagonist and then some kind of wrinkle or complication or, or even reward you know what is the reward for doing this so if it is like five cobalts looking for something what are they looking for have they mistaken the PCs for having it mm -hmm. the idea with these things is is to create something that the players have to act on mm -hmm. they, they can't they, they can't like let it pass them by because it's someone or something that has come to seek them out. You know, there's some encounters where it's like, oh, you witness this thing going on, or this is happening and you could get involved if you want. 
um, you know, eh, I, I find that those work better in, stru in very uh, structured sessions where I have a, I've prepped a lot and have a better idea of what's going on around me. But for uh, improv type sessions, I really want there to be as minimal uh, lulls in the action as possible because I don't know where we're going next. I am having to wing a lot of it, having to rely upon uh, you know, the tools that I've prepared for myself. I really run the risk of having that dead time sort of stretch out as it's like, uh, well, you guys didn't talk to these people I thought you would, and you didn't do this and I thought you would. And, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I guess we get to where you're going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it, um, it, I, the potential for there to be just nothing happening is high. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I prepare for myself is to ensure that something happens. Because I know my brain goes towards a static kind of environment. You know, my, that's where I start when I come up with a location is like, what's in it? What are the objects? Where, and then I people it. And so when I'm asked to do that on the fly, the first thing I go is like, well, it's a place that's got stuff in it. And I, what do you want to do there? <laughs> you know, it's, and there are things. it's not, yeah. It takes some time. It takes development. And then, you know, once I give it some thought, then I can go like, well, it's a place where things are going on. And hey, guess what? There's something of immediate and relevant interest to you. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't take that much time. You know, some of it is about prepping smarter, not harder, uh, which is, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and some of it is just about playing enough to have the confidence uh, of consuming enough of the media surrounding role playing to just have a large tank of, of imaginative fuel to draw upon. Uh, and like Pro was saying, just to be able to listen to feedback from your players, listen to their chit chat, what do they think is going on, mm -hmm. um, and in learning to incorporate that while changing it enough so that. Um, there's genuine surprise and tension and and uh, the like. Yeah, you know, you 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 you've done your some preparation so you can improv. Yes. You've hopefully avoided the pitfalls. Like, but what about post game? Like when you're post -game, done yeah. with this improv session that your players threw you for a loop, mm -hmm. you did your thing. Yeah. Like what what what's an what's important to consider moving into the next session? So to me, the big thing there is um, keeping accurate notes for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know that they're like, you know, like a lot of things are a lot of DMs sort of pride themselves. I don't keep notes or my notes are these scribbles on napkins or whatever I have at hand. Post-it notes like that. for me. Post-it notes or, or another. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I think it's one of those things where, the, you know, when we're DMing and we're, we're in the session, there's so much going on. There's so much happening. There's so much we need to remember and make decisions about and whatever, like just taking a second or two to write down you know, the, a name of a key NPC that was introduced, a decision made by the party that, uh, you know, in that moment you're like, oh, I can use that later, but you don't want to accidentally forget about it. Um, and writing up eventually sort of an after action report for yourself. Uh, it can be a, go a really long way towards just like, number one, rethinking about the game, especially if you sleep on it, right? You've got your notes you took during session, you've mm -hmm. got everything that's going on, but like you sleep on it, next day you wake up, you look at it, and you sort of fill out a literally a report for yourself yeah. <laughs> and it might just be like all right uh what uh, you know what players were present um did anything happen to them you know did any of them suffer a major injury or curse or something like that did they acquire a new item or ally just a quick you know what changed about their situation any major npcs introduced uh, you would want to keep a little record there personality any voice or, or portrayal details uh, that mm -hmm. you had oh yeah and you really just need one or two solid portrayals of a character to solidify them. You know, you don't have to get it right every time. Uh, really just the one time, make a good, making a good first impression with an NPC like that goes a long way. Uh, you know, what uh, plot or narrative or fictional elements did you introduce? Did they, ad did they advance towards any of their goals or anything like that? Um, and this is an area where creating things like ticking time clocks and countdowns uh, can be really helpful. These are structures of play that are really just the DM interfaces with. Players never need to know about it. And they are there to help you keep track of things like, all right, how much does this NPC hate the party? Oh, they're in a two out of four. Of, yeah. of, <laughs> they got half their pie chart filled in <laughs> before yeah, yeah. they're ready to take the next step mm -hmm. in their revenge plot. Or, uh, you know, conditions in the city have worsened by two ticks, uh, you know, thanks to the actions of the party. 
or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and most of these structures are in, you know, sort of impromptu. They're pulled from other games and the like. We talk about them in a variety of videos. The one you're probably most familiar with is combat, um, but there are a lot of different uh, game structures. The big one though is just writing it all out again making sure that what you remember from the game, uh, if there's players who take notes and you have access to them, uh, incorporating their information, and just keeping a record of your game that is easy for you to read. Maybe that involves a spreadsheet. Maybe it involves a notebook. Maybe you can do it all in your head without needing any of this, you know, but something that will help you be consistent and also to be like, hey, this stuff was introduced. We owe it to ourselves to develop it as fully as possible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things that are introduced off the cuff or on a joke, right? <laughs> like there's how many like, a player lot. makes a joke and you're like, yes, let's do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, I've done that many times. Yeah, you know, especially if it's like an NPC or a place or something like that, that's like instant player investment. They're memorable but you want to do them justice. And if you're able to turn a joke NPC or a joke location into a character that they all love and will go to the mat for uh, and spend like their real resources to protect this fictional person, mm -hmm. that's when you know you've, you've hit it out of the park. And that takes work, it takes time, it takes your imagination. And uh, that's the kind of dirty secret of DMing is that no one successful does this without putting in some work. And mm -hmm. it's mostly just like, what kind of work works for you? you know? Yeah, but it's it's never as much work as you think it is, or no. as hard as you think it and is. And if it is... It's just the, the right work for you. Yeah, and if you do find yourself like, man, this is a lot of work, then that should probably tell you the areas that you're over-prepping in. Yeah. And there's something about your sessions that if, you're, if you can kind of uh, look at them from the outside in, you'll see, you'll notice like, ah, yeah, whenever combat starts, I just hit a brick wall with like keeping track of everything. Mm -hmm. Time to start thinking about how, uh, how you structure combats, how you structure the information uh, for yourself. And then eventually you will get to the point where that becomes second nature and you can start building these complex encounters on the fly in response directly to player actions and the mm -hmm. like. So yeah, practice, it's all boring. Practice, yep. effort, dedication, focus. It's not a, it's, you know, what do you think? Just, you know, take some drugs and expand your mind. It's not that. It's if not only that. Don't. don't take drugs, because I think this is, I don't know, the government. They're watching. <laughs> they always watch. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have a pithy, there's no pithy tips, right? And that's, yeah. I think, the pro like, we could, I think, I feel like we should do a whole show on DM advice. Yeah. Because my, the thing about being an advice dispenser uh, is you sort of realize, like, I mean, uh, that you don't really, that it's not needed. <gasps> and also that, uh, <laughs> that there's nothing I can tell you that is going to work better than you just sitting down with the people you play with and talk to them. Yep. You know, or anything like that. So, ask them know. what they want, prepare that. Ask them what they want, prepare for that, and make sure you include stuff for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Tolus is coming back for fit. Wait, for 5e and Cypher fans. Okay. <clears throat> Tolus. No, Tolus. Tolus. I keep saying Tol. <laughs> Tolus. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get rid of my draw, and I need it right now. Tolus. Tolus. <clears throat> book's called Tolus. It's called Tolus, y'all. <laughs> Tolus is coming back for 5e, 5e. <laughs> Tallis is coming back for 5e and Cypher fans. <laughs> no? No? Don't think so. I was thinking about something else. I was like, God, oh, that's proof reading. Proof, proof reading is lying. It's so funny. <laughs> All right.